and the others can uh, rejoin us as they uh, see fit. So um, the next session is is basically all things genomics. So with that, we've got um, yeah three three of the leading people uh, in terms of the, uh, person managing MLA's investment in it, and uh, and two of the the bright young stars of the uh, of the R and D genomics world uh, from the sheep CRC, uh, the sheep CRC joining us. But uh, first of all is Sam Gill, who, for those who don't know Sam, which I don't think it'd be anyone in the room, Sam, of course, previously looked after sheep genetics from 2008 uh, to 2012, and he's been in a third answer, and he's been the genomics and genetics R&D manager for MLA since uh, May last year. So Sam's uh, topic is what we need to do to secure the genomic future. Yeah. So clearly if I stand really close to a microphone, we'll sound like a dog whistle and everyone else will start to come in. Um, I'm really just going to quickly go through a little bit of an overview of genomics, where it's sitting, how it's pulling together, and let uh, Dr. Stephen Lee and Dr. Sam Clark come out with some of the uh, more fun topics as we go. But just very quickly, um, you know, lining up with our last topic, I had the uh, pleasure to go to the... Uh, over to the US a while ago, it's the National Sheep Exposition, or the National Exposition, as we started our talk with um, NSIP and began our relationship there. And I will point out to Reid that yes, you do have the biggest sheep I've ever seen in the world. Standing there at a nice five foot, coming along, very excellent white stuff as we go through. But we're talking about genomics, and it seems that you know every second week or third week you open the paper and there's a nice story about genomics coming through. Um, a lot of press, primarily from the Sheep CRC, involving a number of key breeders, come on down, Murray Long, uh, Andrew Heidrich, and a few other case studies that have been put out over the time. This is just some of the articles that have come out within the last uh, 30 or 40 days or so, but there's a lot of, a lot of discussion about genomics. So this talk is really going to be talk a little bit about where it fits into the scheme of things. So you'll remember these four dot points um, from earlier today. Tom started to talk about it, the four keys to genetic progress as we go through. Being able to pick the better rams, pick them more accurately, um, have more variation to be able to choose from and be able to turn them over a lot quicker so we make more progress through generation interval. And genomics helps us a lot through all of those four areas. For terminal breeds, for meat sheep, um, the challenge is less about generation interval. You're already picking them really early and really accurately. And it's more about those hard to measure traits that you just have no information for at the moment at all. For the merinos, it's really about those traits that you measure later in life or for our maternal breeds, things such as reproduction or adult fleece productivity. You can't measure till they're 24 months of age. Genomics allows us to have reasonably good, accurate selection on those traits earlier in life. So be able to make the similar sort of selection decisions around three to six months of age. Components to genomics delivery as they exist now sort of fit into three areas. We need a reference population to basically set it up and make sure that these tests work. We need the genomic tests to be able to use and then we have sheep genetics as a delivery vehicle to industry for the outcomes of these results. And they're all tied together through R&D initially through the Sheep Genomics Project, which was an MLA and AWI funded program, and more recently through the Sheep CRC, which has just been extended for another five years. The current process is pretty straightforward. We have our normal breeding values, which is a combination of pedigrees and measurements that come together. We also have these genomic tests. Um, we take a genotype, it, it gets run, it's then run through a process that produces a GBV, a genomic breeding value, and that's combined together to become an RBV. And as you've heard from Hamish this morning, a lot of those will now become ASBVs and part of your normal analysis as it goes along. How well those RBVs, those GBVs and ASBVs, so the green parts and the blue parts combined together, is how is dependent on the accuracy of those tests, how well they relate back to a reference population. So a reference population, again, this is a little bit of revision, is simply where someone out there measures a lot of sheep for as many things as possible and then takes a DNA sample on those animals. So sheep are measured and they have a DNA test. And it could be a reference population for any trait as long as that trait is measured and has a DNA test. 
and then we use that information to predict how those, um, someone else can then go and get a DNA test and the information from the reference population predicts how well that test will use in someone else's sheep as it goes along. And that's known as baseline accuracy, which Sam Clark will talk a little bit about. How well it predicts is basically the accuracy of these tests. So the accuracy of these tests, as we're sitting along here at the moment, you know, there's a lot of traits, we'll put them all up there, um, just so you get an idea. The blue lines are from maternal breeds, primarily border esters. The red lines are from merinos. The green lines are for terminal size. But the key thing here is that most of the traits are all above 0.2 of an accuracy, up to around 0.5. They're at a level that's useful and can be used in your breeding programs as you go along. A bit of variation as they go through, but they're ready to be used. So how are they used? How do they fit together? How do they have a big impact on your breeding values as you go along? So this is a question that comes up quite a few times. So using um, you know, a type of graph that sheep genetics has presented for the last 10 years or so in terms of how breeding value accuracy is put together and how the different components of traits, how the different measurements on mums, dads, brothers, sisters, relatives combines into a breeding value, we'll just step through that in terms of how a GVB or a research breeding value comes together. But the, so the first part is really looking at how accurate is a genomic test, how accurate is an animal that's just been measured, so a snapshot, doesn't have any pedigree information or any other information feeding into it, and how do they combine together. So this is for a trait which has a heritability of about 0.35 and an accuracy of about 0.35. So it's probably equivalent to staple strength in merinos at the moment, or muscle in terminal size, give or take. So the green bit is a genotype. So if you just went out and DNA tested an animal, um, that would be the accuracy that you would get back for those couple of traits as you went through. So useful if you just went out and measured that animal for a trait. The blue line is what happens when you just take that physical measurement. So the, you know, just going out and measuring the trait at the moment, for the, in this example, provides you a bit more accuracy than using a genotype at the moment. Combine those two together and you get an increase in accuracy as you go through, but we use a lot more information from the genotype as it goes along because that's a reasonably solid predictor of how that animal's going to end up as it goes along in life. But the key thing is, you know, for an animal that's just been measured and measured alone, the accuracy of how that animal's, you know, how much that measurement's going to predict how that animal will breed later in life is reasonably low. We start looking at young rams, so we're getting some more information coming in, we've got some pedigree information, we've got some measurements from half-brothers that are running around. So the light blue is the component, the information that's coming in from half-brothers. That's the value of an animal's own measurement. That's the value of information from mum and dad as it comes through. A bit of an increase in accuracy. If we add a genotype in there, you can see that you know, the genotype is influencing probably about half the breeding value as you go through. So the DNA information is starting to have a bigger impact in terms of the breeding value. And you see significant differences between a breeding value that has DNA information added to it to one that's just using raw measurements. But you can also see that as it goes along, the relative difference is a bit lower. Once we move into an area where we're starting to progeny test those animals, so it's got 30 progeny sitting there on the ground, as you, as you can see, the normal sort of response in a breeding value, most of that breeding value's information is now being driven from its progeny's measurements, its sons on the ground that have been measured, and similarly the role of that DNA test is very minute. It only has a small influence and there's only a small amount of difference in accuracy. Again, because most of the information is being driven from that progeny test. But the point is that the DNA information has an impact on the breeding value and it improves accuracy as it goes along. So that accuracy is dependent on the reference population and how well it relates, how well the animals that are genotyped and measured relate back to our animals. So what does a reference population look like? What are its components? How many animals do we need to get decent accuracy? What breeds would be involved? What traits should we measure? How do we keep measuring them longer term and who pays for it? So this is also sort of stepping through it. This is something I thought which is kind of interesting to put a little bit of perspective. 
using those same things that we just talked about, what's the value of an animal that's just been measured, what's the value of an animal that's been measured and it's got some, of a young ram, it's got some information on brothers and sisters. This is accuracy going up the side. This is the size of the reference population there, moving up to around 25,000 sheep. For different traits, different heritabilities, you need different numbers. So heritability of about 0.2, which is probably growth rate in terminal size, or WEC in merinos. That's the, the increase in the number of animals you need to measure to achieve a gain in accuracy over time. For a trait of heritability of around 0.3, you need slightly more. For a trait with a heritability of 0.55, which is essentially fibre diameter in merinos, you need a lot more over time. So, to achieve the accuracy of an animal that just has a measurement by itself, how many measurements do you need? So, for a lowly measured trait, you know, roughly around 2,000. For a slightly moderately heritable trait, you know, it's getting a little bit more, around 3,000. For a very heritable trait, you're looking around 8,000 animals in a reference population that you need. To increase that accuracy to, you know, basically be the equivalent to the young ram, as we go through, we start to improve the numbers. You get a slightly, you get a very big benefit in accuracy over time. You can see that it increases very quickly and then plateaus. But for our lowly heritable traits, it's still under 5,000. Moderately heritable, you know, it's around 7,000. Highly heritable, you're talking around 14,000 animals. The holy grail is, you know, having our accuracies at a progeny test level. So, you know, 30 progeny on the ground, what we just stepped through before, you're looking around 44,000 animals that need to be genotyped and measured for post weaning weight in terminal size. Around 54,000 for a moderately heritable trait for fibre diameters in merino, you're looking around 93,000 animals that need to be genotyped and measured to be able to achieve those high level of accuracies. So they're a fair way away. But the important thing there is still, it's a numbers game. The more animals that can be measured and genotyped, the more accurate the tests are going to be. And it's working out the value of those tests over time. So at a very, very basic level, you would say that a reference population, you need around 2,000 animals. If you're going to be in a reasonable ballpark, you probably need a population size around 5,000 animals for most traits that fit within there. Or that roughly equates to genotyping 800 size with 40 progeny within the breed. For the traits that you're measuring, you need an annual requirement. It needs to be refreshed each year, and I'll go through that in a sec. But generally speaking, that would mean around 250 progeny genotyped and measured each year at a very, very bare minimum, um, and around 100 size that you would measure each year as you go through. The reason that you need to be able to refresh this is because genes change over time. So this is um, a neat slide that I pinched from um, Agbu, and they gave it an Angus presentation. So this is really the distribution of terminal size based on carcass plus back in 2003. So it's a histogram, right? It's the number of pole, sorry, pole dorsets, not terminal size. And that's the spread of pole dorsets based on that index over time. So an average of around 140. Skipping forward ahead eight years, which is what we talked around, or two generations, things have changed substantially. So you can see that the average pole dorset from 2003 almost doesn't exist anymore in 2011. The very, very best pole dorset from 2003 is now an average pole dorset. And a ram that had a lot of use, so the best ram in 2003, currently five star, now an average ram as it goes through. So genes change over time. The distribution, the type of chromosomes that are in the, po the population change, so we need to keep measuring that reference population to make sure that those accuracies stay updated. So what breeds fit into it? We just talked about having a hundred size, um, probably each year as you go through. How many breeds actually do that? So this is looking at the average number of new sires that come into the system for each of the breeds in the terminal sire analysis each year. So how many new sires do we see each year on average over the last five years? And you probably can't see it, but there's really two breeds that make up most of that database, White Suffolk and Pole Dorsets. So they're roughly sitting around 400, 450 new size per year that goes through. White Dorpers, you know, there's Daylight, then there's White Dorpers. 
And then there's a few smaller breeds there, such as composite terminals, uh, black dorpers, suffix and texels, which are probably sitting around 50 new size a year. So there's really two or three breeds that at this stage actually have those numbers that are needed to get a reasonable reference population coming through in terminal size. In maternals, similar thing again. We have border lesters sitting around 150 new size and they've been one of the key breeds in the reference population. And then we don't have much else. We've got New Zealand Coopworths over there, which you know, are sitting over 100 new size a year, but they're not Australian Coopworths. But what we can do is if you start putting together some of the trans-Tasman populations, you may actually start to achieve those 100 new size as you go through. So while composites alone won't have the numbers, composites, New Zealand composites, may start to get there. Similarly, Coopworths and New Zealand Coopworths, and Corridales and New Zealand Corridales. So there's opportunities to expand the size to get those numbers if you look further than the borders that we currently have. So what traits are measured? These are pretty straightforward. We've got a lot of normal traits that you see in your breeding objective over time. Um, live weight, eye muscle depth, fleece weight, fibre diameter. They're pretty straightforward. Um, and most of those are reported quite well in sheep genetics now, in land, plant and marina select. So they're not really worth a lot. You've got a number of hard to measure traits which are getting a lot of press right at the moment, so intramuscular fat, lean meat yield, fly strike, foot rot resistance is currently being measured in New Zealand merinos at the moment. They're generally too expensive or too hard to be routinely recorded. They're probably more a target for a genomic test, more a target for inclusion in a reference population or a resource flow. And then you have a whole heap of novel and new traits, things that haven't been measured before are still being defined, still need to be worked out. So things such as nutritional value of lamb, OJD resistance, methane yield, pasture utilisation, all of these sort of obscure new traits that could be useful, may not, but could be useful, are also probably a really good target for measuring in a reference population or a resource flock. So we have a resource flock that's continued on from the sheep CRC information nucleus. So from 2007 to 2011, the sheep CRC ran an information nucleus flock for five years um, over eight sites. The last two years has been an MLA-funded resource flock, which has been managed by the sheep CRC. It's consolidated, consolidated down to two sites, Western Australia and uh, Catania in Western Australia and Kirby at UNE. Um, and that's having that resource flock has been approved by the MLA board and funded through to 2020. So there's another seven years of funding available to run a resource flock. But it's contingent on further investment from the sheep industry. So where we'll see that may change is that we may see there are now more opportunities for breeders, for yourselves, to actually participate in a resource flock as it goes along. First of all, the resource flock will probably move away to you know, achieving a little bit more cost recovery, so there'll probably be at some stage a charge to participate in that resource flock. Alternatively, there's opportunities for commercial flocks or commercial breeders such as AMSIA um, or Dorper breeders to set up satellite flocks that'll be able to feed into that resource flock and the sheep CRC meat program as it goes along. The other question that comes through is how do we sustainably fund these hard to measure phenotypes over time? You know, at the moment they're being funded through levies by MLA that are feeding into these resource flocks. How do we keep these measurements going through? You know, the first questions are obviously, is it worth it? And is there going to be value out of it? But post that, how are they still being funded? And there's probably likely to be a number of options for that. So whether they still is a levy contribution that comes through, whether there's a surcharge on genetics, whether those people who go out and measure those traits themselves actually get some form of royalty or genotype as it goes back because someone's got to measure those traits and genotype them for anyone else to be able to use that information as it goes along. What's it likely to look like? At the moment we've got our research stations which are supplying most of the data. We've got an opportunity there for some satellite flocks to come in, so terminal size, dorpers, maternals, SIRE evaluation could be one of those um, opportunities to participate. You've got a lot of measurements that are coming in through sheep genetics. All of that comes together into a reference population to improve genomics. 
And the coordination component is really making sure we're achieving the design, mating, genotyping the right animals, making sure that those hard to measure traits are part of that process. So, what about small breeds? What about all of these other breeds that are in there? Where are we going? Where does the sheep CRC fit into this? So technology is changing a lot, particularly around um, whole genome sequencing and the use of DNA. For instance, they've actually worked out somewhere that um, DNA is a really, really good form of storage. So as we use hard drives now, DNA could potentially be a form of data storage in the future. And they've actually transcribed the Bible into DNA as a form of storing it, which is kind of funny or very scary, depending on your point of view in the world. But things are changing a lot as it goes along. So the Sheep CRC is working in this area of whole genome sequencing and building on all of the work that gets done in human sequencing and other areas as we go through. The promise of this extension of the Sheep CRC is to be able to achieve a number of things, but the three key promises is, can we use whole genome sequencing to be able to predict the crossbreeds? So if we measure something in polled horses, can we use that to predict um, lean meat yield in Texas or vice versa? Can we reduce the size of the reference population? Because there are some pretty large numbers we put up there before to achieve good accuracies. Can we actually use sequencing information to reduce that? And can we use the subsequent technology that comes with it to reduce the cost of tests? And to give an idea of how that fits together, the Human Genome Sequencing Project initially cost $3 billion. 2001, it cost around $100 million, $93 million to be exact, and over time it's dropped dramatically. Dropped so dramatically that that graph doesn't really sort of give it justice. So this is a change in time from September 2001 to August 2013, starting at $100 million. If we change the scale so it's on a log scale, so it drops down in different units, you can see that it's pretty consistent. It followed something which is very similar to Moore's law, so that the price of sequencing halved every 50 months. Then around 2007, we had a huge influx of new technology. The price dropped substantially, and now it's starting to flatten out a bit, around $5,000. Or in perspective, what was a uh, Jetstar plane, the price of a Jetstar plane at $90 million, is now two flop rounds as we go through. So the cost is changing substantially. Or after cost is out. Use 747s, you could buy three. So the other opportunities for small flocks, you still need a reference population, so you need to explore, you know, small flocks need to explore other avenues to get those measurements in, because that's not going to go away. But for small breeds, you can sample key size now. You can go out and get a blood test, and sheep genetics is storing those, so that when it comes time, and we reach a point where those tests are actually cheaper, there's an opportunity to participate straight away. So just starting to wrap up, we're then starting to move into a new era of um, analysis, and Sam Clark and Steve Lee probably touch on this a little bit as well too, which is known as the single step analysis. Um, Hamish and Daniel also touched on it this morning. It's different in that it puts everything together in the one analysis. So we still need our measurements, just as we talked about before. We still need pedigree as it comes through, but we can also use genotypes or DNA pedigree, DNA to work out the relationships between animals, which is the topic of Sam's talk. What that does though is it opens up a lot of opportunities. You don't need an ASBV in the system to get a breeding value. You can just have a genotype and use that information as it goes along. You don't need to go through an estimated prediction equation or a GBV. It's all part of the same analysis. So it gets refreshed every time we run an analysis, which is really good. And it opens up new opportunities potentially to be able to collect measurements in industry. So for instance, you know, we may be able to start measuring commercial flocks in high risk areas for disease and parasites. Start measuring disease resistance in those, run them as sort of weather trials and start to get some information out the other end. We may be able to start getting information on commercial kills as they go through. So getting large numbers of commercial progenies, running them through the abattoir, using those very neat machines that Richard Apps put up there before, and start to get chain speed measures of eating quality and lean meat yield. Or, you know, we're able to start to get large scale information on preg testing and fertility over large numbers of animals to lift the accuracy for fertility as we go along. So there's a lot of options there as it goes through. So just starting to wrap it up, finalising where we're at, 
At the moment, we have accuracies that are useful, very useful. Steve Lear will talk about the value of those measurements as we go through, but they're part of our analysis now, and as Hamish said, in a couple of months' time, they'll be part of a routine land plan and marina select analysis. We need a reference population to maintain those accuracies or improve those accuracies over time. Someone somewhere has to be able to measure and genotype those animals for any trait that you want to be able to predict but there's a lot more scope for participation as we go forward now. So breeders who want to be able to actively participate in a reference population, there'll be starting to be opportunities as we move ahead, not just um, progeny testing through a resource flock. And we have some future research that's coming through that should be able to help us out in a lot of areas. So the sheep CRC3, the extension will start to look at whole genome sequencing to, with the promise of uh, cheaper tests, smaller reference populations, and hopefully the ability to predict across breeds. And that's a wait and see moment as we go along. So we'll find out whether those promises are achieved in the next two to three years. But ideally, we'll start to move into a system where commercial progeny will be able to be tested and measured and genotyped in commercial situations. And that information will feed back into our reference population to predict, to use for genomic predictions in our seed stock. And that's the aim that we're looking for. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, any questions for Sam? Yes, Sam, there's a lot of good work on genomics to measure that's hard to measure traits. The one that's been talked about a bit over recent years and you briefly touched upon it was um, feed efficiency, feed conversion, which obviously was a massive benefit to the sheep industry. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us any idea if that's possible and when it might be? Yeah, so in terms of feed efficiency, there's been a number of trial work that's been done as part of the sheep CRC at Rutherglen Research Station. Some of those outputs are starting to feed back through. It's, again, it's one of those costly measures that was sort of working through at the moment and I guess leapfrogging off the cattle industry at the moment. So the cattle industry, they have a similar reference population structure called BINs, Beef Information Nucleuses. We don't call sheep SINs, but you know, you could. Um, and the BINs are currently going through and measuring feed intake in a feedlot situation as it goes through at the moment. Um, and they're starting to get some quite neat information. So very early days, but one of the nice stories that could be starting to come out is that it appears that the relationship between key size in one of the breeds between their index and their feed efficiency is close to zero as it goes through, which is kind of nice because productivity and costs are a little bit disentangled there. In terms of where we're sitting with sheep, it's a little bit of a wait and see moment as we go through. So wait till that technology beats down the cattle and then apply it to sheep because you know, it's smaller and it's a bit harder to measure. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Sam. Is there any other questions? Uh, yeah, Grant. Uh, down to Grant. Yeah, Grant. Uh, Grant Burbage. Um, my question revolves around the resource flock and the um, uh, the funding from MLA. I believe is only going to be for meat traits. Um, how are we going to fund the collection of wool data out of that resource flock? So at the moment, it includes a, a yearling fleece measurement on the merinos as they go through. Um, the last two years, that has been effectively provided or donated by AWTA. They've um, provided that trait. That's something we've got to work through for the next few years. But the, I guess the really good benefit from, um, for merinos is, as Daniel said, there's a large number of records in the Merino Select database as it exists now, and a large number of adult fleece measurements that are starting to come through. And by genotyping those key sites within Merinos, we're able to start building up our reference population there. So effectively, some of the basic traits, such as fleece measurements or fertility, reproduction, that are being measured routinely on farm, um, those traits will still feed into the reference population and still provide that accuracy as we move ahead over time, as long as people keep measuring those traits. 
Thanks, Grant. Thanks, Sam. Any other questions, guys? Uh, Sam's also with us for the rest of the day and the night if you'd uh, be keen to discuss more information. Uh, but if not, I'll, uh, I'll call that out there. So if everyone could just thank Sam for his... Uh, <laughs>